Hi, I'm Professor Taylor, and I'm here to advise as to our intellectual property curriculum, as well as our extracurricular activities, organizations uh, that you might want to take advantage of. And so I guess the first question I want to uh, answer is what is intellectual property? And really, we put it into four buckets, patent law, uh, copyright law, trademark law, and trade secrets. Those are the four main buckets. There's other, you know, right of publicity. There's other minor areas, but really those are the four main areas of intellectual property law. So copyright, like uh, you, you probably think of movies and books and um, music, uh, so that, that copyright protects works of expression. Uh, trademark law, we can skip to that. Think of a logo or um, a mark on a good or service, um, Coca-Cola being a famous trademark. Patent law, right, that's uh, rights and inventions. And then trade secret law would be kind of the opposite of patent law, but it's also related to um, inventions, but also um, other um, types of intellectual property law. In other words, um, like customer lists, important business information. So not just inventions, but uh, whereas patent law requires the publication of the invention, trade secret law is based on keeping the information secret. And so they're really, those are the four main areas of intellectual property law. And so we have Lots of courses, lots of activities relate to each of those areas, but I'll break up my discussion in terms of those four buckets of intellectual property. The first thing you need to recognize is patent law is fairly unique out of all of these in the sense that at least one aspect of practice in intellectual property law re requires that you pass the patent bar exam. And so uh, in all of the law, there's really only two, in, in the United States, at least two bar exams. There's your state bar exam, right, which you'll take after you graduate from law school, and then if you pass it, that's how you become an attorney, of course. But even before you graduate from law school, even if you don't even go to law school, some of you even may have taken the patent bar exam. You can take the patent bar exam um, before you graduate from law school. But to take the patent bar exam, you need to have a technical background, either in a science or an engineering degree, or uh, science or engineering work, or at least the coursework. Um, and there's a lot of details related to that, but that makes you eligible for taking the patent bar exam. So for example, I have a mechanical engineering degree. Mechanical engineering degree is on the list of pre-approved undergraduate degrees where you can take the patent bar exam, even if you're not in law school. But when you pass the patent bar exam, if you're not an attorney yet, you're then called a patent agent. If you pass the state bar exam, and uh, the patent bar exam, then you're not only an attorney, you can be called a patent attorney. Either way though, passing the patent bar exam, what it allows you to do is one aspect of patent practice. That is uh, practice in front of the patent office. So that's drafting patent applications, but importantly filing patent applications, corresponding with the patent office. We call this patent prosecution, not prosecution of course in the criminal sense, but prosecution in the sense you're pressing your client's case. Um, you're representing clients in front of the patent off office. For example, if the patent office rejects a patent application, you can draft a response to the uh, rejection by the patent office, effectively argue with the patent office over whether your client is entitled to a patent. So it's called patent prosecution. Importantly though, you can become a patent agent, practice patent prosecution without being an attorney. And so, uh, in fact, what I'd recommend uh, a little aside here is if you're in law school, you ought to consider and you're eligible taking the patent bar exam early in law school. It helps to show that you're really interested in patent law. It helps uh, in terms of getting summer internships, clerkships, and uh, ultimately permanent work. But the point is, that's unique, right? Uh, you have to be able to take and pass the patent bar exam to do patent prosecution. I'll stick with patent law for a minute. That's not the only aspect of patent law there is, right? There's also patent litigation. So patent litigation, of course, you know what litigation is. It's representing clients in court. Well, you have to be an attorney to do that, of course. So that's a little different. But if you're preparing for a practice in patent law, you can think about patent prosecution, which is more transactional, versus patent litigation. Um, and so there's you know, benefits and challenges with respect to each type of practice. But um, just keep that in mind. There's really a third or maybe a fourth area of patent practice. Certainly a third aspect is the uh, transactional practice that does not involve representing clients at the patent office, might rep include representing clients in disputes over patents. And so that would be more like patent licensing, agreement, uh, contract drafting. 
and negotiation. And uh, another area would be due diligence. So in corporate transactions, the intellectual property component of a particular uh, asset purchase agreement or a, a IPO, there, there would need to be an evaluation of the intellectual property. And that's not just patent intellectual property, it includes other forms of intellectual property, but um, that would be like a fourth area of practice in patent law. So that sort of gives you an idea of what uh, patent law is and what the practice would involve. Uh, I've already described trademarks, copyrights, um, trade secrets. So the other areas of intellectual property do not have a separate bar exam. And so sometimes you'll hear people say hard IP, what they're really talking about is patent law. Soft IP, what they're talking about is the, the non-technical uh, versions of intellectual property. So the non-patent law versions of intellectual property. So as you're thinking about taking courses, you would want to think about, do I have the background that would uh, prepare me to actually practice patent law? Let me highlight now, with everything I've said, you can still practice patent law without having a technical science engineering degree or background. Um, that said, you won't be able to take and pass the patent bar exam. So your aspect of patent law might be patent litigation or patent negotiations. I will also say, though, it's harder to break into the field of patent law if you don't have that technical background. So you, you'll confront maybe challenges that other students might not, uh, but you know, we're here to help you to try to achieve your goals and you can make that a goal if you're interested in it. So um, there's also kind of the, the non IP more just technology law as well, which technology law would obviously include patent law, but it would include other things, whether it's artificial intelligence or blockchain or um, just modern technologies, um, um, you know, uh, data privacy and securities and other kind of area, it's not a lot intellectual properties, more technology related, but we can also think about that and include that within this uh, category of uh, um, courses and extracurricular activities you might be interested in. All right, so with that kind of uh, introduction to intellectual property law in general, um, I wanted to highlight kind of the courses that we offer and I'm gonna um, also think about um, kind of breaking these down, I'll do this initially into kind of thinking about your background, what you might be coming to the table with. I'm gonna start with this idea. If you come to the table and you think, I really wanna practice patent law, maybe you have a technical undergrad degree, you're really interested in technology, let me talk to you first. Um, so if you're interested in patent law, I definitely have recommendations. So you wanna look at certainly taking the patent law course, three credit course, but often if you uh, are interested in patent law, people will understand that you are in, in, interested in intellectual property law more generally. So I wouldn't just limit yourself to patent law. I would actually take the intellectual property survey course. We just call it intellectual property. Another three credit course. That course spends about a third on patent law, about a third on trademark law, and about a third on copyright law. So I would not recommend taking the intellectual property survey course if you take two of those three separate courses. So for example, if you're going to take patent law and then you're going to take copyright law, I would not then also take intellectual property law because two thirds of that course would be a review and not get into as much detail as you got into in the other courses. But if you're gonna take one of those areas, I think it's appropriate and it's fine to take the intellectual property survey course. So then only about a third of that course would be more review and two thirds of it would be new. Um, so that's one possibility. As I have already mentioned, another possibility, so to be clear, one possibility is take the patent law course and the intellectual property survey course Another option would be to take the patent law course and then dive into the copyright course or the, the trademark course or the trade secret course or three or all four of those courses. Um, but let me go back. If you're focused on patent law, you gotta, you're you going to take patent law. Maybe you're going to take intellectual property. Maybe you're going to take one or two or three of those other um, particular intellectual property courses. But if you're interested in patent law, you're going to take more than that. You want to take patent litigation, great course. Um, it's a great course for many reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is you get to actually do real work, uh, experiential type work, where you, for example, get to argue uh, a motion in front of a real uh, federal judge. Um, patent prosecution is another great course. Again, patent prosecution is, is about drafting and corresponding with the patent office to argue about um, uh, patent applications and when they're rejected by the patent office. We have a great course. Um, I'm getting into details related to that. 
Um, intellectual property licensing, now I think you have a sense I'm talking about the different areas of IP practice and in particular patent practice. Patent prosecution, patent litigation, intellectual property licensing is a course that you'd want to take to cover the licensing aspect of practice. Um, beyond that, uh, we have a, a, a course, a new course, relatively new called, the newest at least, Trials at the Patent Office. I encourage you to think about taking that course. That gets into the, uh, it's litigation-like, but it's not litigation in federal court. It's litigation at the Patent Office. And, um, and so it's a different aspect of dispute resolution that's becoming more prominent in uh, patent practice. And so I'd encourage you to think about taking that one. By the way, some, some of these courses are gonna include a prerequisite. I believe patent litigation and patent prosecution include a prerequisite. So my point on, on that would be take patent law, your 2L year, if at all possible. We offer it in the fall so that, that you can prepare you to take the courses in the spring. And we often offer the advanced courses in the spring. Not always, but uh, trials of the patent office, I think is often oft offered in the fall. So you'd want to take patent law in your 2L year and that prepares you for trials at the patent office in your third year. So there's some kind of co-curricular courses you could think about. There's a patent clinic. I want to highlight that this is, it gets you real experience. This is experiential, but in the sense that it's actual real clients you represent, um, drafting patent applications, responding to rejections by the patent office. Another thing you can think about is a federal judicial externship. It's not necessarily limited to patent law, but there are certain judges that are in the program that have more patent cases than others. Uh, there's a judge in Sherman, Judge Mazant that has patent cases. Uh, judge Barbara Lynn in Dallas is a patent judge. She um, handles patent cases. So I would encourage you to think about that. And particularly if you're interested in getting a clerkship after law school, I'm on the clerkship committee. I highly recommend clerkships, judicial clerkships. And so I want you to think about that. And uh, we've had great um, success in placing students with judges who hear patent cases, for example, in the Eastern District of Texas. And so um, taking the federal judicial externship course would prepare you well for that opportunity. Another co-curricular in the sense, again, all of these you'll get course credit, uh, the Giles Sutherland Rich Moot Court Competition. It's a patent moot court competition. Um, it's run by the BOA, Board of Advocates here at the law school, student run organization. But I know in years past, they have um, allowed students to compete in that competition, and so I'd encourage it. It's, it would be great for you to do that. Um, so that's really the, the main courses I'd recommend for patent law. What about for the other area? Well, for copyright trademark, let me say this. If you're going to practice trademark or copyright, either one, you probably ought to know about the other area of intellectual property. That'd be my suggestion. So obviously, we have a copyright class. Recommend you take that. We have a trademark class. I'd recommend you take that. Um, I mentioned earlier there's a trade secret class. It's called Trade Secrets and Business Torts. Um, you could take that. It includes, for example, the right of publicity, um, other business torts uh, that would be relevant. And so those, by the way, I, I didn't mention it earlier, but when we have adjunct teaching courses, they're typically two credit courses. So uh, if we think back intellectual property is three credits, patent laws, three credits, patent litigation is two credits, patent prosecution is two credits, IP licensing, I think is typically two credits, although it might be offered as three, depending on who's teaching it. Trials at the patent office is gonna be two credits. Uh, the patent clinic, I believe, is three credits. Uh, federal judicial externship, I don't remember. And the moot court, I think, is one credit. So copyright depends on who's teaching it. Professor Bloom, who's full-time faculty, when he teaches it, it's three credits. When an adjunct teaches, it'll be probably two. It could be three. Um, the trade secret course, two credit. Trademark, two credit. Um, so within this area of copyrights and trademarks, in particular for trademarks, I'd actually encourage you to think about taking franchise and distribution law. As well, I believe there's an international franchising and distribution law course. Taught by adjuncts, two credits each. But um, franchising, a significant part of franchising is licensing of trademarks and trade dress. So I uh, encourage you to think about that one. As well, particularly with respect to copyright, um, is entertainment law. I would encourage you to think about that. Sports law would be another option. Again, those are both taught by adjuncts, two credits each. Um, sports law will get into some aspects of, of trademark, um, probably less IP focused than the others that I mentioned. Um, so again, copyright, trademark, we have the individual courses, we have some kind of uh, courses that relate to those. Um, as well, there's a moot court competition, the Saul Lefkowitz trademark moot court competition. I'd encourage you to think about that as a one credit. 
Okay, so if you're interested, uh, and those are the basic courses. We, got, we have more courses than that. I'm going to talk a little bit more, but I'm getting into some of the areas of IP. I didn't mention trade secrets, but if you're interested in technology, you might already be in thinking about patent courses. Uh, maybe I should add that course, the trade secrets course, if you're interested in technology and the law. Think about the, uh, the trade secret and business towards class. Um, as well, I mentioned earlier, you can think about more general technology type courses. So I want to encourage you to think about, for example, data privacy and security. Um, talking about um, the rules, the federal law related to um, keeping customer information private and secure and what happens when there's a data breach. Uh, what are your obligations? Um, we also have some newer, uh, a newer class that's going to be offered blockchain technology, law and policy. And um, as well, uh, there's another course called technology, innovation and law, and that's designing legal applications or legal apps. And so those are other courses related to just the technology and the law that you might be interested in. Um, as well, we can also think about um, one of your requirements before you graduate is to take an edited writing course. If you're interested in intellectual property law, we have two of those types of edited writing courses. One is intellectual property and business organizations. Another is selected topics in intellectual property. So intellectual property and business organizations really focuses on startup um, entities like partnerships or limited liability companies, um, how they use intellectual property to create value and to protect their value. And then selected topics in intellectual property is more of a seminar style where you get to pick a particular topic. And both are edited writing courses. And um, so I'd encourage you to think about that. There's other edited writing that kind of relate to uh, more particular uh, other areas of law, but may touch on intellectual property. An example of that would be topics, selected topics in antitrust. And I didn't mention antitrust before. It's one of those courses that's another course that you could take if you're kind of interested in what courses might touch on intellectual property issues, antitrust would be one that would, for example, touch on patent law and some of the limitations on patent law that antitrust places. Um, so as, as well, for really any of the areas of intellectual property, if you want to think about, there's another course, international intellectual property. Some of these courses I should mention are only offered every other year. So for example, in your 2L and 3L year, if you see some courses offered, I would recommend you jump on them. So an example of that would be international intellectual property. I believe we typically only offer that every other year. Another example uh, may be uh, intellectual property licensing. More recently, we've been offering that every other year. Um, many of the courses though we offer every year. So when you're looking at signing up for classes, I'd recommend you actually go on our website, uh, the registrar's website where they list the courses and you can look back at uh, the last year and, and look and see what courses have been offered. But just because they were offered in the last year, don't assume they're going to be offered every year. Okay, so um, I'm going to go back in my notes here. I'm going to look at, you know, uh, different semesters and typically what courses are offered because I want you to think not just in the short term, which hopefully my last comment highlighted, but also think in the long term. And so you want to, um, for example, take the courses that are foundational and that serve as prereqs for the more advanced courses. You want to take those early in your your stay here at the law school, really in the early part of your second year, if possible, um, so that you can take classes that you want to take and you're not a hamstrung. So for example, uh, I'm just going to look at, like, at the time I'm recording this, what we're offering um, kind of going forward. So as it turns out, this summer, uh, we're going to be offering selected topics in intellectual property, um, which is an edited writing course. Um, and then in a, in a typical, and, and that's you know, you just have to look at the summer schedule to see what's being offered, but don't overlook the summer as a possibility. We're going to look at the main semesters, right? In the fall, we often offer the intellectual property survey course, just called intellectual property. We often uh, offer patent law. Again, those are two foundational classes. Uh, we actually offer many of the advanced courses as well, but let me stick with the basic courses. So intellectual property, patent law, trademark, sometimes copyright also trade secrets. So really all of the areas of IP, the foundational classes we typically offer in the fall. Copyright, I think would be one exception. We may only offer that every other year and sometimes in the spring. The more advanced classes, in international intellectual property could be in the fall. Um, trials at the patent office could be in the fall. The patent clinics every semester. Um, trade secrets, I mentioned that one. Uh, I haven't mentioned the small business and trademark clinic. I should have mentioned this earlier when I talked about the uh, copyright and 
and trademark. If you're interested in copyright and trademark, there's a clinic, small business and trademark clinic. They don't get too much copyright work, but I know they get trademark work. Um, it's an, again, fall semester, so small business trademark offered every semester. Uh, franchising distribution law has been offered in the fall. Antitrust has been offered in the fall. Technology innovation, the law designing legal apps in the fall. Blockchain in the fall. Um, judicial externship in the fall. Intellectual property and copyright every other year, sometimes in the fall. As I transition and think about the spring semesters, we, we typically offer patent prosecution and patent litigation in the spring. So you might think, well, do I want to take both of those in the same semester? Maybe you'd want to take patent law in the fall as a prereq, then take patent prosecution and patent litigation in the spring. Or maybe you take one in your two L year in the spring and you wait till your third year, take the other one in your third year in the spring if you want to space it out. Um, I should mention there's a, the course that's taught every other year called Patent Law and Institutional Choice. It's kind of a capstone course. Rather than focusing on patent law and the substantive requirements, for example, to get a patent, it focuses on the law governing the institutions and the patent system um, and some unique aspects of that. So we have a patent office. We also have the Federal Circuit, which is a unique appellate court with exclusive jurisdiction in appeals and patent cases. And those are two examples. So that course is a, a more seminar style involves some field trips. I encourage you to think about that. But that's typically offered um, every other year in the spring. Intellectual property licensing is a possibility, sometimes offered in the spring. Um, sometimes the um, editor writing courses I mentioned are in the spring. Every semester we, we have patent clinic. We also have small business and trademark clinic. So anyways, as you can tell, lots of courses. Um, one thing I also want to mention is kind of what are the overall non-IP specific courses you might want to consider. One in particular, if you're interested in litigation, you need to take evidence. Evidence would be a course I'd recommend for um, anyone interested in litigation. And so if you're interested in, in intellectual property litigation, I would still recommend you take evidence. Um, beyond that, every once, uh, every once in a while, I know there's a, there's a deposition type of class offered or experts and experts in deposition. Classes like that would be interesting. Also, uh, any classes related to small business and startup, if you're interested in technology and you might want to think about small business and startup type uh, classes. You can look for those. Um, beyond courses, though, I actually wanted to talk about other things for you to think about at the law school and opportunities that you have. So um, I mentioned some of the externships, so the co-curricular activities, judicial externship program. There's also the corporate counsel externship program, and there are a couple of companies I know that have been involved in the past, uh, AT&T and Ericsson. And if you have a uh, particular interest in intellectual property or technology, you can um, um, contact the faculty member who's running that program and ask if they, there is a possibility to get placed in a company um, that does significant technology related work and even intellectual property work and I think they'll work with you. As well in terms of other externships, we have at the law school set up externships with the University of Texas at Dallas, the University of Texas at Arlington, and UT Southwestern. And so those are in the tech transfer offices of those organizations. And so if you're interested in that, you can contact me and I have my contacts in those organizations. I can help you get set up. And um, sometimes though, they're going to look for people with particular backgrounds in particular technology areas. What I would say is if you have a science background in particular, those are, where e it's easier to place you in those externships. And so I would encourage you to contact me, for example. Um, so, you know, other than that, there's other opportunities at the law school. You can, you can uh, think about the Thai Center. High Center for Law, Science, and Innovation. Um, significant um, opportunities to get involved and to at least go to programs, conferences, workshops, lectures related to intellectual property and technology, and I'll talk more about those. There's a student-run organization, the Intellectual Property Organization, or the IPO. They often um, sponsor different activities. I think often they do a um, patent bar exam, kind of uh, informational. Um, as well, I know they have been uh, bringing in law firms to do more uh, law firm specific programs so you can get to know some of the attorneys at local law firms, get to know the local legal community. Um, and so uh, I want to go in terms of events then that you could think about attending. So um, certainly the IPO events firm specific or the, um, the patent bar exam related uh, informational. The Thai Center events, we hold lots of events. There's something called, there's events called Thai Talks. And Thai talks relate to bringing in local attorneys to discuss 
um, topics, kind of current events in intellectual property law, and they kind of give you a sense of what attorneys do in the intellectual property field and give you examples and tell war stories. And it's usually over, over lunch, you get a free lunch. We have a big event every year called the Intellectual Property Symposium. And uh, it's a full day symposium. We'll bring in professors, often judges, uh, local practitioners, national practitioners, and uh, focus sometimes on patent law, focus sometimes on copyright law, sometimes focus on all areas of IP. But it's a, it's a great all day event, very, um, very fun and interesting. Um, breakfast, lunch, and a, and a reception afterwards, so you get some food too. We often have lectures. We have something called a leadership lecture where we'll bring in government uh, leaders. So we've had the director of the US Patent and Trademark Office. We've had the chief judge of the uh, Federal Circuit come. Um, so we, we've had great, um, the, the chairman of the FCC has come. We've had great success bringing in leaders in government to give talks to students. We also have something called an innovation lecture. So that's a little different. It's not uh, government leaders. It's leaders in industry, and so we've um, we've had some great innovation lectures. And we're going to have more of those where we bring in significant leaders from industry that have used intellectual property or or um, have developed really incredible technology and have had great success. Um, not not all ways are they going to be attorneys as well. They, um, think about it in terms of serving clients and um, what they're interested in and how you can meet their needs. Uh, as well as I want to encourage you to think about joining local, national, or international organizations. So the Dallas, starting local, the, the Dallas Bar Association Intellectual Property Section has great programming, once a month CLEs that you can go and meet uh, local intellectual property attorneys. Uh, national organizations, right, the Intel uh, American Intellectual Property Law Association, AIPLA, would be great, and they have a student division. Um, INTA, International Trademark Association. So there's lots of um, opportunities for you to get involved and um, kind of meet people, attend uh, events even outside the law school. The other uh, um, opportunity I'll mention to you is the Intellectual Property American Inn of Court. It's the Barbara Lynn American Intellectual Property Inn of Court. Uh, an Inn of Court is unlike, uh, it's, it's similar, but it's different than what you do in your one year at the law school here. It's the idea of um, uh, matching up as a pupil. You're a student, we call you a pupil. We'll have associates, like one to five year attorneys, somewhere around there, um, six to 10 year attorneys called barristers and then masters, you know, I think it's something like 12 years and more experience. Um, and so it's, it's uh, intellectual property only focused in of court. There's other ends of court that are not intellectual property focused, but this one um, has met at the law school regularly. And so what happens, you, you get nominated for that. So the professors here will nominate students to be involved in the, uh, the Inn of Court. And so there's monthly events where you get to effectively have CLE, but get to interact and have reception and uh, network with intellectual property attorneys and leaders in, in the intellectual property community here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. So that's a lot of information for you. Um, wanted to be as kind of complete as possible. Um, I think I wanna highlight the professors here were all um, interested in helping you. So you can contact us by email um, you can um, call us, swing by our offices. We're here to help you. And I do hope you got good information here today. But if you have follow-up questions, feel free to contact us and we'll do what we can. Okay, good luck.